So hi, my name is Namita Bardwaj. I'm a primary care sports medicine physician at the University of Texas Medical Branch. My name is Jay Chen. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at the University of Texas Medical Branch who specializes in foot and ankle surgery. This is part of the Family Medicine Radiology Educational Series. We will be talking to you about ankle fractures and reviewing ankle x-rays. We both have no disclosures regarding this topic. When we look at, at the ankle, there's three common views that you're going to do. Um, the AP, the lateral, and the mortise view. The ankle consists of three bones, the tibia, the fibula, and the talus, and it consists of two joints. Um, the ankle joint, which is where the tibia, fibula, and talus meet, and the syndesmosis, where the tibia and fibula meet. When you first look at the AP, the distal fibula should be slightly superimposed on the tibia. The lateral and medial malleoli should be in profile. And then the tibiotalar space should be open, although the full mortise isn't visible. When you're looking at the lateral view, the following bones can be assessed. The tibia, the fibula, the talus, the cuboid, the navicular, the calcaneus, and the fifth metatarsal. The distal fibula should be superimposed by the posterior part of the distal tibia. The tailor dome should be superimposed as well. And then the joint space between the tibia and the talus should be uniform. When you're looking at the mortise view, the aim of this is to assess the articulation of the ankle joint. So the lateral and medial malleoli should be in profile. The mortise should be uniformly visible which is in direct contrast to the AP view. And then the base of the fifth metatarsal should be included in the view. So now we're gonna move on to the common adult conditions that we will be discussing. We will touch base on the ankle sprain and discuss the Ottawa ankle rules. We're gonna talk about distal fibula fractures and the Weber classification. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about pilon fractures and uh, pilon slash tibial plafon fractures. Starting with the ankle sprain. Usually it will commonly present as lateral ankle pain after an inversion and plantar flexion injury. Um, most common patient demographics are young females or males, young athletes who sprain their ankle often. Um, you will find laxity of the ankle on the anterior drawer, tailor tilt, or posterior drawer of the ankle examinations. And this is where your Ottawa foot and ankle rules come into common practice. So starting with the Ottawa ankle rules, which help to determine if an X-ray of the ankle is actually indicated, you have pain either at the medial malleoli, lateral malleoli, pain at the base of the fifth metatarsal, pain at the, at the navicular, or inability to bear weight. That indicates X-rays for your foot and ankle. So we're gonna start off with looking at our X-rays for our ankle sprain patient. So again, reviewing, this is the AP. So this is again, remembering that the distal fibula should be slightly superimposed on the tibia, which we see. The lateral and medioli should be in profile, which they are. And then the tibiotalar space should be open, although the full mortise isn't visible, which is our X-ray is very normal in this respect. And this is findings that are consistent with an ankle sprain. One thing we can see um, on ankle sprains with this X-ray, is an avulsion fracture, either at the tip of the lateral malleolus or the medial malleolus, and most commonly the, the lateral malleolus in, in routine ankle sprains. Um, these, these findings are just a small fleck of bone, probably one or two millimeters in size, uh, just distal to the tip of the fibula. And even though it technically is a fracture and the radiologist will call a fracture, um, it is more indicative of an ankle sprain, and that's the way it's treated. Looking at the lateral of our x-ray, we can again look at our, the bones that we need to double check, the tibia, the fibula, the talus, the cuboid, the navicular, the calcaneus, and the fifth metatarsal. Those all look good. Um, the distal fibula should be again superimposed by the posterior part of the distal tibia. The tailor domes should be superimposed, and then the joint space between the tibia and the talus should be uniform. And lastly, looking at the mortise view, this is us looking at the integrity of the ankle joint. Um, you can see that the lateral and medial are in profile. The mortise is uniformly visible. 
And the base of the fifth metatarsal is good and has no fractures. So what do you do with an ankle sprain? Um, you can consider an MRI or ultrasound to evaluate the integrity of the ligaments. Uh, but surgery is usually reserved for, for the chronic, um, for chronic instability and when they fail non-operative treatment, which, which Dr. Bardwaj will talk more about. So the mainstay of treatment is price. That's the mnemonic I want you guys to remember. So it's protection, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. So price. Um, I would recommend use of a lace-up ankle brace. The way I describe it to patients, it's like the old school roller skates that helps provide more stability to your ankle. Um, typically, I recommend it for sporting activities, not for everyday use, but some patients might benefit from using it all the time. Um, proprioception I, exercises are the most important stay, main stay of treatment in the sense that it helps you to regain your balance and the nerves and the muscles to remember where they are in space and prevent the rolling of your ankle, which is what leads to the ankle sprains. And physical therapy, of course, is what helps get back that proprioception and that stability and strengthening those muscles. All right, the next topic is uh, rotational ankle fractures, and this is something that I see in my practice all the time. Um, so clinical case correlation, typically this is a, a low energy mechanism of injury. Um, it's a rotational injury. So an example is someone's foot got stuck in a pothole um, and then they twisted it. And oftentimes you'll see people that walk their dog and their dog ends up twisting their ankle or they trip over the leash. Um, so it's usually a low energy rotational injury. Um, it can affect all ages and all genders. I've treated patients that were uh, 12 and under. I've treated patients that were in their 90s with rotational ankle fractures. Um, when they come to see you in, in urgent care, typically, uh, they'll have pain and swelling over their lateral ankle. Uh, they may have a whole lot of bruising at the time. And importantly, usually they are not able to bear weight on the affected extremity. Uh, there's several classification systems, uh, but probably the simplest one that's commonly used is called the Weber classification system. So the Weber classification system consists of uh, Weber A, B, and C type injuries, and they're used to basically um, to classify the, the fibula fracture. So a, Web, a Weber A uh, fibula fracture is one that's below the level of the syndesmosis. A Weber B fracture is a fracture um, that is at the level of the syndesmosis. Uh, Weber C injuries are those that um, are fibula fractures that are above the level of the syndesmosis. Here's an example of a, of a very bad one that may show up to, to urgent care or, or the emergency room. Um, so here's that Weber C fibula fracture. And then obviously with rotational ankle fractures, it's not always the fibula that's fractured. You can have a medial malleolus fracture here. This is called a posterior malleolus. This is the back of the tibia that you can see on the AP view. So Weber C fractures are, are bad actors. Um, they typically require surgery and usually some kind of a reduction in, in the emergency room or, or in the urgent care setting. Dr. Chen, how quickly should these um, Weber B and C fractures see you? Um, that's a good question. For I, I would prefer that they see me if, if they are reduced in the emergency room adequately and, and sent out. Um, I would prefer to see them within the next week. Uh, usually surgery takes place in about one to two weeks because you have to wait for the soft tissue swelling to subside. Um, so if I can see them early within the within the first week, um, I can put them on my surgical schedule and adequately plan their their surgery. The other thing with these these fractures, especially the Weber C fractures and the the rotational ankle fractures that are not only fractured but dislocated, such as this patient here, these patients oftentimes are not able to be adequately reduced and splinted um, because their fracture is so unstable. And in these cases, uh, don't have any hesitancy to call the orthopedic surgeon on call because oftentimes these require an external fixator um, while they're in the hospital before they can be safely discharged. So the x-ray findings on rotational ankle fractures on the, on the AP view, uh, once again, going over the structures that we should, all, we should all know pretty well. The lateral malleolus is over here, and this can be fractured, uh, such as this case here. There's a fracture right there. The medial malleolus uh, is over here. These are not always fractured in rotational ankle fractures. Sometimes the energy, which can affect the, the medial side, doesn't break the bone, but instead tears the deltoid ligament, which connects this structure here, the medial malleolus, to the talus over here. So on this x-ray, I want you to note this is called the medial clear space. So the space between the medial malleolus and the talus, aka the, the medial gutter, is wide in this space. So typically it should be about four millimeters or less. 
Um, and this, this wide clear space indicates an unstable ankle injury because the lateral side is broken over here with the fibula fracture and the medial deltoid ligament has been torn and that allows for this medial clear space to open up. So this is usually a surgical indication. This is a mortise view, uh, like Dr. Bardwash talked about, it shows the joint really well and it's not gonna look as pretty congruent as the x-ray she was showing earlier. And that's because there's disruption to the mortise. So the mortise is actually disrupted and affected. On this view, you can really tell uh, the medial clear space here is definitely wider than the space above in the tibio tailor joint and also the lateral clear space. And then finally, on the lateral view, when these when these fractures show up to your urgent care, um, it's very important. This can this can assess uh, posterior dislocation of these injuries. So that becomes something that makes it a, a little bit of a bigger deal. Um, so you can look here at the talus over here. It's not sitting underneath the tibia. In fact, it's posteriorly subluxed. Um, in addition, you can see a posterior malleolus fracture, which is this fracture fragment right over here. Um, one more thing to, to talk about with rotational ankle fractures in terms of x-rays, um, there's a view called a, a gravity stress view. Uh, sometimes you'll have an x-ray like this where the distal fibula is clearly fractured in the medial clear space. You're not sure if it's injured or not. Our last type of injury that we're talking about is a pilon fracture, um, otherwise known as a tibial plafond uh, fracture. Um, so you know, these patients often present, uh, these are unlike rotational ankle fractures, these are high energy injuries. So you'll have a, a patient who fell from a, a height, such as a roofer who fell off of a ladder. Uh, sometimes patients get these with car accidents. Um, so an example, usually you'll, you'll find a male, uh, not to be gender biased, but a young male in their 30s who had a motor vehicle accident uh, coming into the emergency room. Um, they'll have pain, swelling, and inability to bear weight. Um, oftentimes, they'll even have open um, open fracture blisters um, on the on the fracture site. And this is what a, a pilon fracture may look like. So, so this is way different than the x-rays we were showing earlier with rotational ankle injuries. You can see the, uh, the fracture through the distal tibia and the distal fibula. It just appears to be high energy um, and complete, uh, complete fractures of these bones. Um, you know, usually affects the distal metadiaphyseal region of the tibia, which is around here. You can see the fracture line over here extending down into the joint. Um, on the lateral x-ray, you can look for um, lateral sagittal plane uh, malalignment. Uh, you can identify the apex of the fracture. So here, um, these injuries are, are uh, really, really bad news uh, for both the patient um, and for the orthopedic surgeon on call. So uh, when, you, when you have these injuries that you see, um, these should not be sent out uh, just in a splint or, or a boot. Um, you know, a CT scan is, is helpful um, to evaluate the fracture pattern, uh, but the fracture is, is really bad. Most likely, um, we are going to place these in an external fixator. Uh, so the key points for these injuries, um, most of them do require some form of an initial close reduction, uh, but they will also probably, they should be externally fixed, um, fixated at some point. Uh, so don't send these out of the ER without talking to an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and then again, the final fixation is usually performed a few weeks after the initial injury. In, in summary, um, we just want to reiterate, do weight-bearing views if the patient can bear weight. Um, that would be ideal for the x-rays. Make sure you review the x-rays cri critically. And then when in doubt, ask for help.